And now for the Gospel reading appointed for Reformation Sunday from St. John, chapter 8. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated. So, as an Episcopal priest, it feels a bit presumptuous of me to stand here on Reformation Sunday before a bunch of dyed-in-the-wool Lutherans and preach about the enduring legacy of Martin Luther and his fellow Reformers. I mean, who am I to tell you why Luther is important? To be sure, I am named after the great reformer, and I was born and baptized into the ELCA before I became an Episcopalian. And my family on my father's side does trace its ancestry all the way back to Martin Luther's mother's family in Eisleben, Germany. And I do still keep on my desk my great-grandfather's copy of Luther's small catechism. But even so, those accidents of history still don't quite qualify me to lecture you faithful Lutherans on who Luther was or why we celebrate him this day. And in any case, I'm pretty sure you don't need another lesson on Reformation history. I mean, after all, we just celebrated his 500th anniversary of um, nailing the 95 Theses on Wittenberg Castle door. You already know about them. You know about his groundbreaking translation of the Bible from Latin into the vernacular language of the people. You know of his trenchant attacks on the papacy, a papacy that was so obsessed with maintaining power that it hoodwinked the people into thinking that their salvation turned on the buying and selling of indulgences rather than on their own faith in Christ. And of course, you know about Luther's eloquent insistence on the priesthood of all believers, not just those who wear collars. And you probably know, too, that Luther dramatically changed the course of Christian music by empowering the whole congregation and not just the clergy and choirs to sing hymns and chant psalms as part of our worshiping life. You don't need to hear these things again. So we can probably skip the history. And indeed, I'm pretty sure that were Luther with us, he would wince at all this attention on himself and the other reformers. And he certainly would not want a preacher to waste his or her precious time in the pulpit talking about the mere work of mortals when the only subject worthy of our attention, as he repeatedly said, is the good news of God in Christ. So without further ado, let me then turn to just that, today's text from John chapter 8, and in particular, verse 31, where Jesus says, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now when I turned to one of Luther's commentaries on this verse from John, This is the advice Luther gives to preachers like me. Quote, Above all else, be sure to announce loudly and clearly that the day of liberation has come. Now, declare unmistakably to the congregation that they have been delivered from their woes. The preacher must announce with boldness that freedom has happened and that there is now no condemnation but only love for those in Christ Jesus. Preach with urgency so that your listeners hear the most important news they can possibly hear. Sin and death have been routed by Christ crucified and risen. The Son of God himself has made all of us free, and we are free indeed. 
full stop, end of quotation. So there you have it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed by Martin Luther himself. And if I were a wise, wiser preacher than I am, I would just sit down, shut up, and leave it at that. But unfortunately for you, I'm not all that wise. And since I have a little more time on my hands this morning, the mischievous lawyer lurking within me wants to ask just one more question. Free to do what? I mean, it's truly wonderful to learn that because of Christ, we are freed from the bonds of sin and death. But that leaves me wondering just what we are to do with this newly won freedom of ours. This, in fact, is a question that concerns St. Paul a great deal in his missionary work and writing. Paul recognized that the message of Christian freedom is a dangerous one and was so for his largely Gentile audience, raised as they were in a Greco-Roman culture, not unlike our own, I might add, defined by hedonistic self-indulgence. So Paul warned them, to say that a Christian is free is not to say that one is therefore free to indulge in whatever satisfies the self's appetite and, and inclinations. On the contrary, Christian identity is about turning oneself and one's heart over to Christ so that we cast aside our naturally and ultimately destructive self-centeredness, and instead become free to serve the other. To be free in Christ is to choose to open ourselves to the Spirit who leads us into a life characterized by the nine fruits of the Spirit. And you remember them from Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. To quote Luther again, in Christ through faith we are freed from the tyranny of ourselves so that we might through love become slaves to one another. That's worth hearing again. In Christ through faith we are freed from the tyranny of ourselves so that we might through love become slaves to one another. That sounds counterintuitive. Who, after all, voluntarily wants to be a slave to someone else? But then think about it for a moment. Who is freer? The confirmed bachelor who enjoys a life of unfettered sexual promiscuity, or the husband and father who in his deep commitment to his wife and children discovers the enduring wonders of parental and marital love? Who is freer, the citizen who exercises his freedom not to vote and disengages from political life to pursue individual interests, or the citizen who runs for office and immerses herself in working for the common good, seeking to balance the competing interests of everyone in her community and promote the overall welfare? Who is freer, the young adult who exercises his freedom to quit college to do what he wants, or the one who submits himself to the rigors of a demanding academic curriculum, trusting that the experience will open up a whole new world of ideas, dreams, and opportunities? You get the picture. These examples illustrate a classic theological distinction between negative and positive freedom. Negative freedom is simply to be free from constraint, able to choose what you desire to satisfy your own appetites. That this is the freedom of Adam and Eve in the garden, a freedom that is exhilarating at first, but a disaster in the long term. Positive freedom, on the other hand, is the choice to submit oneself to an external reality, trusting that such obedience to a higher power will lead to growth, goodness, and abundant life. This is the freedom of Jesus Christ, 
who teaches us the great paradox of the Christian life, how denying oneself and loving one's neighbor in fact draws us into the fullness of God's love. So if all this is true, how and where do we learn to practice such positive freedom? Well, one of the central purposes of this place, the church, it turns out, is to be a training ground for this positive freedom project. Thus, in church, we say prayers of thanksgiving so that we learn gratitude. In church, we sing songs of praise so that we can feel the joy of God's presence in our hearts. In church, we confess our sins so that we can practice humility and recognize our dependence on the God who sustains us. In church, we pray for one another so that we can bear one another's burdens in empathy and kindness. In church, we offer up our treasure when the collection plate comes around so that we can experience the liberating power of generosity. In church, we share the bread of Christ's body so as to experience the mystery of God's presence among us in ways that defy words. Church is the training ground of the spirit to exercise a positive freedom So if you came to church this morning feeling overwhelmed or hurt or angry or just depressed and not sure what you can do to make a difference, my advice to you is this. Take a deep breath. And as you do, corny as it may sound, inhale the positive freedom of Christ and exhale the negative cynicism of the world. Inhale the positive freedom of Christ and exhale the negative cynicism of the world. And then start doing what Christians have always done when they are at their best. Love your neighbor. For the truth is that the Christian life is and always has been about the small stuff. As Margaret Mead once put it, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people doing their bit to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. And you know as well as I do what loving your neighbor looks like. Buy a meal for someone who is hungry. Hug someone who is hurting. Reassure a child who is scared. Visit someone who lives alone. Donate your time or money or both to an organization that is making a difference. Give a flower to someone you love and then give one to someone you can't stand. It's actually not that hard once we all start rowing in the same direction. It's about being relentless in our love, steadfast in our faith and never, ever willing to give up on one another and the building up of God's kingdom.